130,000 Iraqi troops stormed the capital city of Kuwait, installing a puppet government in the economically strong country. The United States condemned the attack and demanded Iraq withdraw troops from Kuwait immediately and restore the Kuwaiti government. A line has been drawn in the sand. The United States uh, has taken a firm position. The fact is that Saddam Hussein has continued his buildup in Kuwait. He's got over 400,000 men now in Kuwait or southern Iraq. It gives no indication of being willing to withdraw from Kuwait. And uh, we think it's necessary to make certain that we've got the forces over there to deal with any contingency. America is The United States relies on the Air Force. And the Air Force uh, has never been the decisive factor in, in a battle in the history of wars. Uh, that area is as flat as a pancake, nothing out there. He cannot move without air superiority across that ground. I left them building bunkers along the seacoast and around our embassy. I saw no indication that they planned to leave. There's not going to be Panama or Grenada or Rambo-like movie. This is going to be a bloody, long, terrible war. We will take uh, probably heavy casualties if we go up against a sophisticated heavy force. You're going to have to have a major bombardment, by all means possible, you know, against the dug-in forces along the Kuwaiti-Saudi Arabian border and against the reinforcing forces. You create a situation that forces his reserves out of their defensive positions, get them out in the open and moving, where we can make use of our superior intelligence, our superior uh, weaponry, and our air power, particularly our air power, to destroy him out in the open. You start with a strategic air campaign to hit strategic targets in Iraq. Our aim is to ensure that if force must be used, it will be used suddenly, massively, and decisively. It would be a killing on both sides, not on one side. If there is any bloodshed, I can assure you, Saudis will take it before their friends. War is bloody. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off. Hello. And then we're going to kill it. Now to Saudi Arabia and Charles Jaco. Charles, are you still hearing me? Charles yes, Jaco is uh, just. Yes, the air raid sirens are just now going off here near these U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia. We've sent the entire camera crews inside right now. We're all preparing to put on our gas masks, as we've been told. There are sounds of planes overhead. We don't know whose planes there are, but air raid sirens are going off insistently. There are military convoys on both sides of me. We're being told to get off this platform and get inside into the air raid shelter immediately. But right now, everyone's been training for this, and uh, it looks like we may have to. The skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. We're seeing bright flashes going off all over the sky. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. Short again. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that one was a shack. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off. Hello. And then we're going to kill it. I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq on this particular day. Keep your eye on the crosshairs. Right there. Look at here. Right through the crosshairs. And now in the rear view mirror. <laughs> you 
found uh, a whole group of trucks and oil barrels and uh, APCs that they hadn't dispersed. And uh, that was, of course, uh, very much of a fun mission because you can actually see what you're hitting and parts of trucks you know, flying all about. And it uh, was well, very rewarding, so to speak. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. Operation Desert Storm. Soldiers will remember it as the 100-hour ground war and history books will record it as the first air war to carry on for more than a month before ground troops fully engaged. Saddam Hussein promised to make it the mother of all battles. And it was. 6-6, this is 7-2. I got uh, guys off my nose about 600 meters jumping up in the air. However, the Iraqis were at a great disadvantage. Saddam's troops eventually lost the will to fight as the might of the coalition brought Iraq's war machine to its knees. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. And soon, we will open wide our arms to welcome back home to America our magnificent fighting forces. We came. We fought. We won. Those were the words of the American troops. But there was a decisive battle fought weeks before the ground offensive which foreshadowed the outcome of the final battle. It was known as the Battle of Kofji. Kofji is located just inside Saudi Arabia on the Kuwaiti border, just a few miles from where Saddam's troops were dug in. The Iraqis saw the capture of that border town as an easy victory, and perhaps a way to force that mother of all. On January 29, 1991, they moved in. An unmanned Marine reconnaissance aircraft recorded the event. J-STARS also detected the invasion. This modified Boeing 707 aircraft is equipped with a synthetic aperture radar. It can track moving targets with pinpoint accuracy and relay that information to command and control centers or airborne attack aircraft. This is a J-STARS visual representation of a column of Iraqi armored vehicles. In the air, AC-130 Spectre gunships also found the Iraqi columns, columns which became targets. A Marine airborne forward air controller had visual contact and passed the information to the gunship. What he then is he told us, hey, we got a bunch of Iraqis coming into Kafji, a bunch of armored vehicles, and uh, for your tasking this evening, he wanted us, basically told us to take on anything north of the town. What uh, resulted with that, we uh, got a lot of vehicles and uh, personnel carriers that were moving south um, down towards the southern part of Kuwait. We also um, identified a looked like a convoy of probably somewhere around 25 to 30 vehicles that were running east-west along the border. And once we got clearance, we were able to fire on those also. Yeah, we stopped them, the ones that were still out on the road. Now, the ones that were in the town by then, we didn't see them, but we caught everything that was on the road and we destroyed everything we saw. There was a whole lot of AAA coming up at us, but the good thing for us was when we had gotten there, this was the first night of the uh, assault that the uh, Rockies made. So they didn't really get the real heavy stuff in yet. It was like the more of their lighter equipment was in place. I would tell you, I don't think that uh, battle is over by a long shot. I expect a lot more fighting will probably occur tonight. And I would tell you that, uh, you know, obviously we've been talking and, uh, and, uh, and we're ready for whatever comes in there. By morning, Saddam's 5th Mechanized Division was dug in. The town belonged to the Iraqis, and Marine artillery moved into position. They pounded the Iraqis. 
Green Cobra helicopters moved into the city, destroying Iraqi tanks and armored personnel carriers. They also targeted Iraqi spotters hiding in parts of the city. Commencing, I've got the tank over here. Commencing, i got a tank over here. I want to take it out. Get it, get it right down there, right two o'clock. There, 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 take it, take it. Now, now, that's it, take it out. <laughs> You can't just look at Kafka and say that's the only part of the battle. Because uh, once you start the contact there and you make the engagement, then you have to assume that there's going to be follow-on forces coming down to take advantage of any uh, breakthrough that they might have had. And so you look back up the road and there were lots of units moving and there were tanks and APCs moving. And by their travel, you could uh, say that they were going to come to the, uh, to the Battle of Kafka. So then we put forces, put air power on those uh, moving uh, units, and they became targets, and uh, that was just part of the battlefield interdiction. In the north, Coalition observers saw more Iraqi tanks and armored personnel carriers heading south to assist the Iraqis already in the town. However, coalition forces had air supremacy. Marine Corps officer Jim Brayton, attached to the Saudi troops in the area, coordinated the air support around Kafji. We had an OV-10, like I told you, they, they acted as our eyes most of the time. As he went across the border and uh, said he had a tank column that was moving to the south towards the city said, okay, you know, talk to the F-18s and send them after it. Uh, and he sent the, uh, the uh, basically 18 F-18s. The first section took out the uh, lead tanks. The second section took out the back tanks. As soon as they got hit, they stopped moving. And most of the people were jumping out of the tanks and leaving them. Somewhere in the vicinity of 700 to 750 uh, enemy troops in there, and with the possibility that they're reinforcing uh, through the back door, but bringing more troops down more troops Kuwait. down. But at this particular point, we're very successful in stopping that, primarily with airstrikes and with uh, artillery, but for the most part, air airstrikes. The Hornets destroyed their targets, as did the A-10 warriors. We came across an armored column that stretched a good uh, couple of miles long. Probably, you know, we could count to between 20 and 30 uh, armored vehicles on the road. Okay, I have vehicles look like they're on the road. They're on the road. That's a firm. All bunch of vehicles. I'm setting up a bomb. Copy, you're going to get one pass at it. Copy that. Good that? Yeah, that is running away. That night when we left, and it's a sight I'll remember for forever, you know, there was at least a couple of miles of road on fire, essentially, with vehicle halts. And uh, a vehicle burning at night really, you know, has an image that you'll never forget. The whole spectrum of coalition aircraft was effectively employed during the battle. We're now beginning to see them uh, cut their vehicle convoys down to five and ten vehicles at a time. Uh, clearly some indication they're trying to minimize uh, the target they present to our friendly air. A major lesson learned from Kafji is that air power can effectively attack moving ground forces even when those forces attempt to hide under the cover of darkness. The Battle of Kafji uh, brought home certain lessons, certainly for the Iraqis. One is they had no sanctuary for movement of large number of forces at night. Joint Stars was going to pick them up, and Air Power is going to pick them off. They kept repeating uh, a phrase which uh, the Saudis roughly translated as, uh, no more air, no more air. 
uh, when they saw the air, they would hunker down by the vehicles. They'd try to get under something. Uh, even though they were our prisoners, they were still frightened by the sound of, uh, of the attack air coming by them. By the use of air power and the effective use of air power on them, they lost their will to fight. And so I think air power early on caused that. And then once they got into the battle, they saw it firsthand, and they definitely lost their will to fight. What is the situation now, sir? Khafji is all clear. Now we are uh, uh, controlling it, and we have uh, everything as it was before. Uh, there was a lot of uh, interdiction from our side, which stopped their major attack, and that was the main important thing for us. With air power stopping any Iraqi reinforcements, the Saudis retook the town of Khafji two days after the Iraqi attack. Shot up armored personnel carriers and tanks littered the town. About 500 Iraqis were captured. Others died. Victory was not without a price for the coalition. 11 Marines and 15 Saudis died during the battle. And a gunship was shot down, losing all 14 on board. However, with the offensive at Kofji crushed, any Iraqi plans for heavy bloodshed or political gains also vanished. In many ways, the Battle of Kofji was downplayed at the time. Uh, first of all, we didn't really understand what the objectives of the Iraqi army were. Second of all, so few Iraqis made it across the border that it appeared to be some sort of a minor action. And then finally, we were so engrossed in the oncoming offense in the uh, western area, the so-called Hail Mary operation, that we didn't have time to look at it. We didn't have time to see it for what it really was. After the war, and you had time, and you saw the condition of the Iraqi army that surrendered to our oncoming forces when we did cross the border, you began to realize that the Battle of Kofji was a very critical battle, because it's the one where the Iraqis were attempting to seize the initiative. It's the one where they were attempting to turn around this sort of death spiral their army was caught up with as it was locked in place in the desert and pounded from the air. The Iraqis were doomed to endure the continuing air campaign until the time of the coalition's choosing for any ground combat. Throughout the desert storm, and particularly in this one very uh, tenuous battle, the Iraqis were denied the use of the air where we had complete control of the air. Uh, I think the outcome speaks for itself. If you don't control the air, you better not go to war. In retrospect, the Battle of Kofji is a tremendous victory for the Saudi army. It's a tremendous victory for air power. And it's a tremendous victory overall in terms of what happened in Desert Storm, because it laid the final nail in the coffin of the Iraqi army. Today, the Battle of Kofji is still being fought on computer. Do you want me to then kill the sim right where the, when the bombs hit? The Air Force analyzes these and other battles to find out the best way for air power to support the Joint Force Commander. Future battles are fought before they happen through computer simulation, so the United States can assure victory in any conflict, any time, anywhere. During the night of January 29th, the Iraqi army launched more than two divisions toward the small border town of Kafji. As you have just seen, the battle covered by the press was only the tip of the iceberg. The Iraqis launched their attack under the cover of darkness, but Joint Stars identified the rear elements of the Iraqi army moving to penetrate coalition lines. Coalition aircraft were quickly redirected by the Joint Force Air Component Commander to halt this potentially disastrous Iraqi offensive. That night and into the next, our airmen flew hundreds of attacks against the Iraqi armor columns that were dozens of miles behind enemy lines. The outcome was swift and decisive. Today, we are continuing to update our models to understand and teach the lessons that we all need to learn from Desert Storm. The battle at Kafji demonstrated what airmen have known for a long time, that air power can provide 
the heavy punch needed to stop enemy armored thrust dead in their tracks. You have just witnessed a case study on the power of modern air and space forces. The Battle of Kafji was an enormous defeat for the Iraqi army, but one that took place far from the coalition soldiers fighting on the ground. To many of you, especially our veterans of past wars, the ability of air power to decisively halt armor and infantry is a story you have not heard before. It may be hard for many to believe that airmen and their weapons have come so far. But I assure you, we have. And the Battle of Kafji is not just an Air Force story. It demonstrated the capabilities possessed by the air arms of all the services. Air and space power today and in the future provides the ability to destroy armies and promise to keep our armed forces predominant in the 21st century. Desert Storm demonstrated the true strength of joint operations. Not the notion that each service must participate in equal parts in every operation in every war, but that we use the proper tools at the proper time. In Desert Storm, a critical tool was certainly air power. that border and come down here, I'm completely confident that we're going to kick his butt when he gets here. It would be a massive destruction to the American lives as well. When you, when you get up there, you know, and you kill all the tanks, try and leave a few for the Army, okay? <laughs> Let's go get him, General. You better believe him. We're going to do that. I'm often amused when I hear people talk about the 100-hour war. It wasn't a 100-hour war. It was a 1,000-hour war, of which 90% of it was done from the air. Hello. A little bit of chaff. Let's beat feet. There's egress and haste. 